The speaker of the hour is Bill Goring. Bill was born in Higginsville, Missouri in 1944 and raised in the greater Kansas City, Missouri area. He was baptized in 1968 at the Winter Road Congregation and attended the Kansas City School of Preaching from 1970 to 73. He has also attended the Free Hardeman College, Oklahoma Christian College, and Ozark Bible College. He has taught in several schools of uh, preaching and spoken on various lectureships and gospel meetings throughout the Midwest and southern United States. He continues, uh, he contributes art articles for various Brotherhood papers as well as tracts for the uh, International Bible Study Series. Bill currently serves as an elder in Chipman Road Congregation in Lee Summit, Missouri, where he also preaches. Bill is one of the instructors of OABS and, um, and the eldership at Chipman Road that oversees that work. I want to start and thank this congregation out of the bottom of my heart. For 40-some years, I've been able to speak on this lectureship and be a part of it. Lord willing, I will continue to do that, or if they put up with me. I think so thankful for the elders here, and I've known the elders before them, and the elders that are here now, and been able to see some of them grow. A lot of the young people in this area, I knew them when they were in their mother's womb. The ladies that have prepared our food, I watched them, some of them grow up from little children, such as Kimmy, we call her, and others such as that. You just don't know how much I appreciate the congregations around here and so many of the good friends that I have. And I see them come here from year to year and they come, they speak the truth. But more importantly, they not only speak the truth, they live the truth. They're willing to stand up against error, proclaim it. Not tell someone else after they have preached the subject, oh well, the elders say, oh well, if you have a problem with something one of our speakers says or something they taught, you come to us. And you talk to us, as David and I were talking this morning. No, if you have a problem with me and something I say, you come to me. I don't want somebody else taking up for me because I will take up for myself with the Word of God. So therefore, that is the way it should be. And Chuck and I were talking. He said, what subject do you have? I said, the conversion to Lydia. He said, well, there's not a whole lot there. I said, well, I'll just ramble on then. <laughs> kind of like I'm doing now. And he said, no, don't do that. So if you have your Bibles, open with me, and we'll begin to talk a little bit about the subject that I, that I have this morning or this afternoon. It actually begins back in chapter 15 of the book of Acts. The apostles and like-minded men had just met in Jerusalem. They had met there, and that's what some individuals call the Jerusalem Council. There were those that were teaching that if you're going to be a Christian, you cannot be a child of God nor a Christian unless, and this is the Judaized teachers, you be circumcised. And this was a teaching that was going about, and they didn't meet there to figure it out as a council. They didn't meet there as a board of directors over a denomination. But they met there that the Holy Spirit might tell them God's word. That circumcision wasn't going to avail from that point on or before that anything one way or the other. But they did have a message for those men to go out and to proclaim. And shortly after that council or that meeting, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, after some discussion with Barnabas, small Paul, Silas, and Timothy began their missionary journey. 
Paul said, let us go back to some of the places in which we have gone. Let us go there and see the brethren, see how they're doing. You know, one of the greatest and most thrilling things that is going to happen to you as a gospel preacher, as a Christian, is to be a part of the establishment of a congregation and to see people that have heard the gospel and be brought to Christ. It's not how many people you have sitting in an auditorium. Although if you preach the gospel, there are going to be those that will obey. There are going to be those that are going to become Christians. They're going to be established in a community. And hopefully they attend or they have to or should the worship service. If you're a part of that, I don't see how anybody could not be thrilled to death to see those conversions. But as we go on, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, we're going to go in one direction. But you want you to notice something. It says in verse 4 there of chapter 16, And as they went through the cities, they delivered them that decrees to keep that were, notice, ordained of the apostles' elders which are at Jerusalem. They told them about their meeting there in Jerusalem. They told them about those things. And so listen to something else as they began on to their journey. In verse 5, And so were the churches established in the faith, increased in number daily. It didn't mean that someone just came along and joined a congregation or joined the church. They were established in the faith. The faith, the doctrine, the word that was spoken by the apostles through inspiration, that man would have an opportunity to accept, as Brother David said this morning, or to reject the gospel of Christ. There is no force involved. God did not say and God does not make someone to obey the gospel or to deny it. Although God knows what we're going to do when we hear it, He knows way, way more than we do about every human being. But He knows if there's going to be obedience or not. God knows that. But it's up to you and me to go out and to begin to teach it, no matter what you and I might consider the result to be. But I want you to notice here in verse 8, in that same chapter, and they passing by Messiah came down to Troas. And a vision in verse 9 appeared to Paul in the night, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over in Macedonia and help us. In other words, God was speaking through to this messenger to give this message to Paul. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. By the way, on the way, the Apostle Paul did meet Timothy. And after he had seen the vision, immediately... We endeavor to go into Macedonia. And he says there, we went into Macedonia, surely gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach what? To preach the gospel unto them. And in verse 12, we find they ended up in a certain city, in a certain place. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part, that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And so here the course had been changed. They had decided to go by the inspiration of God to Macedonia, to a city there, it is called Philippi. Now you look at the church and you look at the letter that Paul writes to the church of Philippians. I believe, and I understand it correctly, which I could be wrong, you straighten me out if I am, but is this not the beginning? Is this not the beginning of the congregation 
in the church of Philippi. Philippi. The Philippian church. And here we have the beginning of that. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by the river. And notice he goes on to say, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake. It is my understanding, probably, and it says here, on the Sabbath, and here is their attitude. And I, I don't believe just only on the Sabbath. They just told us what day that was. That was, yes, the Jewish day of worship for them, but not for these men. Because they knew that they were to meet upon the first day of the week. So that's not what we're looking at here. But we're looking at the idea this was their daily life. Think about the night they spent before. Think about how Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Think about maybe when they were lying there resting their heads. And maybe in their minds and maybe discussing, we will pray in the morning. We have a whole city here. We have people. We have individuals that we can go preach the gospel to. And so therefore we will take advantage. But let's start our day off with prayer. Pray for themselves. Pray for forgiveness for sins that they committed. To pray for the city, to pray for those that they were going to be proclaiming the gospel to. That they would hear, understand, and that they would be obedient. Brethren, you and I need to have that praying attitude before we go to anyone or any place. Pray that I might be able to preach the gospel and to preach it only not to allow anybody to misunderstand or to take for granted that I already know where they're at and what they're going to do, because we don't. But we know this, the gospel must be preached. How many times have we heard it said already this week, and the week's not over, that how shall they hear unless they be taught? How shall they be taught lest they have a preacher? That doesn't only mean the man standing up here behind the pulpit. You're all preachers. All of you. Each and every one of us are to preach and to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here are these men. They went down by the river and there they were praying. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made and sat down and spake, and they saw someone there, the woman which resorted there. Doesn't give us her name yet, but they saw someone. They saw an opportunity. They saw someone that needed to hear the gospel. Now, there are some things we're going to point out about this lady in just a moment. But let's get through our context here. Let's get through what the Bible is teaching us about this conversion. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, opened the, uh, notice the Lord heart, the Lord opened. She attended unto the things which she were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, her and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be fruitful to the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained them. In other words, she persuaded them, urged them to come to her house. We look here, we see something. First of all, there are those that say, well, yeah, the Lord opened her heart. You know, that's what, exactly what happened. And that's what Brother David was speaking to this morning and about. 
That's what many men have said right here behind this pulpit. Yes, the Lord opened her heart, but how did he do it? I will submit to you it was not by the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. I will submit to you it was not the Holy Spirit came down, tapped her on the shoulder and said, Oh, we know you're a woman of faith because you're down here by the river and the Bible says you are a woman of faith. And so therefore, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Oh yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. You're saved. Well, that's a beginning, but she wasn't saved. But the Bible does say she was a woman of faith. And it gave her name. It even gave to us her, you might say, what she did for a living. The Bible said Lydia, a seller of purple. Now, in that day and time, a seller of purple. I don't understand all I know about this. So let me just put it this way. I understand that this beautiful color, and I'm, I'm colorblind, in case you don't know it. I've got dyslexia and everything, so you've got to forgive a lot of things of me. But the fact is, purple is a beautiful color. Am I correct in saying that if I understand correctly, and I've read a little bit about it, but that doesn't mean I know much about it, that that color actually comes from some kind of fish that comes from the sea. You might know the name of the fish. You might know more about it than I do. But I know it took work to get there. I know it took some people to go and to obtain, bring it back, and it needed to be processed and then it needed to be put into a dye, and that dye would be put into clothing, different things such as that. And so therefore, I understand it is a very precious commodity. And this woman had to be a woman with a good sense of business, because it calls her that, says so she was a seller of purple. Now, did that mean the dye? Did it mean the clothing? What did it mean? Well, all of those probably. And it says she was from the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. In other words, there were those there that worshipped God. And notice, and heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. How does the Lord open your heart today? He does, you know. He does. He opens your heart today. He opens it with His Word. Jesus said in John 17 that the, the words I speak unto you, these are the words you're going to be judged by. These are the words that are going to bring you to understanding. And is it not true that throughout all the lessons we've heard this week so far, that every time we see a conversion, it is because someone has taught them the gospel? Someone has taught them the gospel. I cannot have enough praise for the intention, for the attitude of those that taught me the gospel. You know, the gospel began as first as I can remember being taught to me by my grandmother. My grandmother was one of the establishing members of the church at Higginsville, David. They met in the old city hall, which I, last time I was there, is gone. But they met in an upper room there. And I can name some other individuals that, that were there, and I was a little boy. And she was there a part of that. We're looking at a woman here. We're looking at someone. And my grandmother worshipped God and she taught me the gospel. I didn't pay much attention. I didn't want to listen to her. I did not certainly want to go to church with her. But she drugged me anyway. 
And while there, she would flip my ear every now and then when I made a wrong move. You see, grandparents back then didn't mind spanking you. Now, I'm not spanking any of my grandchildren. I'm not going to do it. Or grandchildren. It's not going to happen. And I hope they're not listening. But the fact is that I'm just not going to do it. But she did. So then she went to my father, taught him. She taught my mother. My mother was baptized first. And then my father was baptized later. There was no congregation in Higginsville at that time. They either went to Oak Grove or Odessa at that point in time. And I believe they went to both congregations. Well, eventually they started a congregation right out there on the same spot where David preaches right now. They were able to build a basement, worship it in a while, and then they built the structure above that. Again, I was forced to go to church there, David. My daddy would make me go. My mom would make me go. And I had it in my brain, well, I'm not going to go back when I get big enough to make up my own decisions. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I did do what I wanted to do. And it was the wrong thing to do. But lo and behold, I met the most wonderful lady in the world. This is not a story about my life. I'm just rambling on now. You got it? <clears throat> but my wife vowed, well, we have children now. I'm going to take them to church. She was a Baptist. And my dad said, well, I'm just going to teach them different. She said, well, what difference does it make? He said, you take them up here to the Church of Christ. Take those grandbabies up here at the Church of Christ. She did. The old Winter Road congregation over here. And then there was a man named Matt Kraft who <clears throat> at that time was a preacher there. And after a period of time, why she encouraged me to go, they encouraged me to go, my mother and father encouraged me to go, and my grandmother encouraged me to go. So one day I came home and I told my wife, I said, I'm going to church tomorrow. And I did. The next Monday or Tuesday, I forget which it was, preacher came out to our house. He taught us. He took Nancy, my wife, and I, when we said we needed to obey the gospel, went up and we were baptized into Christ. That began our Christian journey together as husband and wife. Now you might say, what does that have to do with this lesson? Here's what it has to do with it. From this woman's conversion came a whole congregation of people. And Paul visited them over and over and over by a letter, by, an, by inspired letter that is. And many people were converted. You know why? Because this lady right here, when it says, she heard and she obeyed the things and notice that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Let me submit this to you. When she attended unto those things, it meant she confessed Christ before man. That she repented of her sin. She was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God added her to the kingdom, the church, the body of Christ. And when that happened, here's some characteristics of this woman that we can pull out of this. I've only got seven points. That was just the introduction. First of all, she was a woman of hospitality. Should we be not hospitable? Don't we need to be that hospitable when you and I have an opportunity, when we have those around and about that people that visit in our congregations, people that need things, hospitality. Isn't that true? Because in verses 12 through 15, she offered them a place to stay and made them feel welcome. I know, as well as you know, that one of the qualifications for an elder that we're given in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is to be hospitable. Now that doesn't mean, and by hospitality I don't mean, okay, every time there is a gathering, every time somebody wants you to come to this or to come to that, 
I'm going to say something that's going to get me so deep in trouble here, I don't know what I'm going to do to get out of it. So forgive me, okay, ahead of time. There are just some things everybody wants to be invited to, but nobody really wants to go. I'm being truthful here. I'm not going to lie about it. And there are some of those things I don't want to go to. But yet at the same time, my door must be open. My door must be open to each and every individual that needs me and I need to be willing to walk out it to go to others and they need to be able to walk in freely if they want to. And this woman said, come to my house. Come to my house. I want you to come here. I want to. And I could just imagine when they went to her house, which they did, and she, the conversation that took place there, she told her servants, she told the rest of her family, all that were there, go prepare food, bring it, set it before these individuals. Let's be hospitable unto them. And out of that hospitality, there has to be a certain amount of generosity. And the book of Acts, Lydia says here, was also a successful businesswoman, so she had to have generosity and be willing to share what she had with others. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19, she provided Paul and her companions and gave generously to the church. You see, these are things this woman did. Generosity. Something else. She was a woman of faith. She wasn't saved by faith only, which has been pointed out. But in Acts 16, verse 14, it says she was a woman of faith. And we already mentioned she wasn't saved just because she believed in God, but she attended to the things which she was taught. Remember, we just read that. She was a devout worshiper of God even before she met Paul. Her faith, God allowed her to open the message of the gospel. To listen to it, Paul preached to her and experienced true conversion. I want you to notice something else. She was a lady of humility. He didn't say, by the way, I got the biggest house in town. I'm a seller of purple. I make a lot of money. And you come, I'll make it very comfortable for you, men. I know you've had it rough. I know you've been walking. I know that you have gone many places. And maybe even last night, you slept out here by the riverside. I, I don't know. But you come, I'll make things comfortable for you. After all, I'm very wealthy. She did not say any of those things. But she just begged them to come and to be with her. And notice what she said. If you find me faithful, come to my house. Come and lodge there with me. In other words, I'll give you a place. A woman of humility. Lydia was humble and receptive to new ideas. She didn't already have her mind made up and, and have her jaw set as I as used to be the old saying. You're not gonna you're not gonna change me no matter what. She didn't have that. She had humility. She was willing to listen and to learn. Is there anyone in here today that doesn't need to listen and to learn something from the Word of God? Well, I'll tell you what, my hand cannot go up. I cannot say, no, not me. I know just a scratch of what I need to know and what I want to know and what I would love to know. But keep on studying, brethren. Be that person of humility which has your ears open. Open for a couple of things. Number one, open to learn. Open to have an open mind. And when God says something, obey it. Do it. Have the humility to obey it. I once had a Bible study with a lady in Odessa, Missouri, many, many, many years ago, and she was a Methodist. Her family had been for ever, ever since I could remember. We sat down, we had what back then we called them cottage meetings. 
I know that's an old saying, but that, that's what we called them. And we showed the Jewel Miller films, and I didn't know a whole lot at the time, but, you know, we went through that. Then we opened the Bible and started talking about that, and questions started going. And then pretty soon she said, well, I know what you're saying. You're probably right, but I've been a Methodist too long now to become a Christian. And I'm sitting there thinking, did she really say that? And she did. Elderly lady, sweet lady, gave me cookies, gave me coffee. Neighbor, whatever I needed, you know, she was there. Her husband passed away. Hey, listen, my whole shed out here is full of tools. You need any of them to work your garden or anything? Come get them. It's all good. Good lady, wonderful lady. You know, on the day of her death, it was very sad because we had had that Bible study. I could give you her name, but I'm not going to. But the fact is that did she have humility of heart and willing to listen? I believe Lydia was that woman of humility. She didn't brag about what she had. She didn't say, well, I, I'm going to hang on to my old Jewish religion. She didn't say that. No, she listened. Another thing, when you talk about humility, you have to talk about the open-mindedness. The open-mindedness. Her mind was open, willing to embrace the things that God was willing to give unto her. She had perseverance. We don't, you say, well, where do you see that, Bill? Well, the other lesson we can learn from Lydia is that, is that she was a preser preserving woman who never gave up easily despite her early challenges and difficulties she faced in her life. As believers, we are called to persevere, to keep on keeping on. No matter what the hardships, no matter what comes our way, and, and believe me, I, I look over this audience and I know some of you, and I know the hardships, I know the pain, I know the suffering you've gone through. And I would hate to tell you it's all over. I would love to tell you that, excuse me, I, I said the wrong word there. I would love to tell you it's all over. Old age, John. You're getting there. I would love to tell you it's all over, but it's not. The old world has plenty of tricks to play, yet the God of this world wants to play them. He wants you to suffer. He wants you to have pain. He wants you to stop. He doesn't want you to invite the holy people to your place. He doesn't want you to be a part of that. He wants you to give up. He doesn't want you to persevere which means keeping on, keeping on. Now, you all might think that preachers out there, they never get discouraged. They never get, uh, you know, call it whatever you want sometimes. But, but let me tell you, they do. I don't so much anymore because I'm looking for that goal in heaven and I got my mind straightened out and I've got stubborned up. I'm going there. But I remember when I first started preaching, you young preachers, listen to me. About every business meeting, when I come home, I told my wife, I'm done. She said, no, nah, Bill, stick, stick it out another few months. We'll, we'll make it. Here I am today, 50-some years later, been preaching. Fact is, yeah, we need to keep on persevering. There will be splits in congregations. There will be congregations like the one at Philippi after it was established. You know, we see the beginning of it here. But even Paul had to write to them and say, y'all get some things straight here. Get things right. There's some things going on shouldn't be. You need to get closer to God. Love God more. Do better. Keep on persevering. False teachers, they're around. I said Sunday night in a lesson at Chipman Road. I don't know. I don't see too many of them here today. Maybe I'll run them off that night. I don't know. But here's the fact. I told him, I said, every time we get up and have a Bible class, we want to talk about the denominations. Well, then you better get closer to home. Closer to home, we got plenty of false teachers in the church that we need to deal with and not be afraid to deal with them. 
Will it take courage? It will. Will it take perseverance? It will. Will it take them trying to talk about you or discourage you or to get other people not to like you because you teach the truth? You better believe it. You see, the Apostle Paul, even Silas, even Timothy, these men could have went on their way and not bothered with anything and saying, I'm not going to take it anymore. But they persevered. They kept on keeping on. And this lady did too. Matter of fact, what was this lady to do with herself? I want to submit to you Titus chapter 2. For I believe she was the kind of person, she had the quality, she had the ability, she was one that would spend her time in doing what? Teaching the younger women as it talks about in Titus chapter 2. To be keepers at home, to be lovers of their husband, to raise their children, all of these things. Someone, and by the way, this is, am I correct in this? I might be wrong. I think this is the only lady conversion we're talking about here, aren't we? In the book of Acts here, right? Specifically named. I know there were others, but she's here for a reason. God knows we need beautiful women. God knows we need those with beautiful hearts that are going to go out and they're going to teach our younger women. And our younger women need to look up to these older women that have been around a while, been through all the misery and the pain and the suffering, challenges with their husbands as preachers, challenges with their husbands as deacons, challenges with their husbands as elders, and see the things that have gone on. Don't let it all sound negative because it's great because conversions are being made. Congregations, there are those that are going to heaven. I'm not real concerned about numbers. We convert someone, they're brought to Christ, we teach them, continue to teach them. But the young women need to be taught. Let me ask you something. In your congregation, who teaches your little children? <laughs> Here you go. John pointing at his wife. I want to tell you right now, Ain't no way that I have the ability. I can talk to you, but I ha don't have the ability to teach two and three year old children. I like to play with them, torment them, and all that, but to sit down and try to teach them to get them, uh -uh, I don't have that kind of patience. I don't have that kind of knowledge, to be honest with you. It is the women. I'm just telling you. And this is what Paul tells the women to do. Comes Jeff. So she had to have leadership qualities to a certain extent, didn't she? But Bible classes may be for women. You see, this is the qualities of a conversion. Chuck, I don't know what you think. I think we learn more from the lady than I even realized before I ever looked at this. And I begin to see some great qualities in a lot of great women. But I have one last point I want to make, the influence. The great and wonderful influence that, children, that, that ladies have on our children that ladies have on their husbands. And after all, did not God see fit to give Adam a wife to be his helpmate? Not less than he. Not somebody to boss around, order around. But a woman... God knew it would take to help this man live his life and to be what he ought to be. In my life, there were three wonderful women. My grandmother, my mother, and my wife. My mother, grandmother, of course. I don't still have them with me. And I'm going to be in trouble for bragging on my wife, but I have her. And when we stop 
and think about these things. This lovely lady, whose name is Lydia, was certainly a great, great help meet to the congregation that she was in. All because some men went down by the river. They went down there to pray. They saw a woman there. They saw her probably doing her work, a woman of faith, took advantage of an opportunity and taught unto her Jesus. And she obeyed the gospel of Christ. And from her, from her, and others that were at her household, when she invited the apostles there, when she invited them there, and they were able to teach, a congregation grew and was of a great benefit to the, the, the places of Macedonia and Achaia. Brethren, I thank you for your time. I thank you for putting up with me. God bless each and every one of you.